everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Thursday edition, a little bit different. Uh, we were supposed to have Sam Evans on today. He will be on tomorrow's show to talk about Forex markets. So you guys get a heavy dose of me, which is good because I've had a ton of questions come in recently and I want to make sure I get to them all. Anyway, I hope you're doing fantastic out there. Kenichiwa, as I saw come through the quotes. Hello, everybody. Um, we are going to do a little bit on candlesticks today. It's not going to be like an immersion into candlesticks. Maybe I'll do that at some point. I think that could actually be very beneficial for a lot of you. I'll also give, uh, as I see some people here asking for recommendations on books and things, I'm going to be kind of mean and say, don't, 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 don't waste your time. You can learn everything that you need to learn about Candle 6 from a one hour video with me. And I may give away a lot of that stuff today. Um, down the road, I'll probably do a more in depth thing on Candle 6. But you really don't need to buy a book unless unless you want a cluttered bookshelf. And I'll, I'll show you what a cluttered bookshelf looks like. So there, there's uh, that. that's mine. Those are all just trading books out there, most of which I just haven't read. I'm not a big voracious book reader. I find. Um, my best results personally from my learning style are just by doing and immersing myself in it and understanding what candlesticks do. So we'll do a lot with uh, candlesticks today, at least with regards to two sp or four specific patterns. One was a request from a viewer, so I will dive into that and I'll show you my personal favorite. So that'll be it for today. I also got a few other questions I wanna get to. Of course, feel free to send in your questions in our chat, as everybody loves to do, and I will do my best to uh, bring all those into today's discussion. Now, it is a special day because today is officially the 30th of April, which means it's done. Yes, we do have the futures markets trading a little bit here, and you could argue that that might uh, count still towards for today. But I wanted to, just, instead of doing the top seven like I normally do, just do a month in review because there's been a ton of pretty crazy moves out there with regards to our market. So I will start there with your, I'll call it your market update, but let's be honest, it's really like a monthly market update for for what we're talking about today. So we'll start with showing you the full screen here. I'm gonna bring up, uh, what's, let's, what the, you wanna start, let's start at the bottom and work our way up. Obviously, I think we all know and can just shake our head at what's happened with crude oil. This is the last month out there for, uh, crude oil. Hello, Allison. Nice to have you joining us. Allison's a friend of mine who's been lurking in the shadows and finally speaks. She's alive. She speaks. Um, there's the month for crude oil, which has been pretty ugly, most of which has been just exaggerated by that 20th and 21st move in April. What's interesting is if you were to look at this chart without that percentage move, and mind you, since the close of May 30th through, or sorry, May 31st through today, one month of trading activity, you're down 26.86%, roughly. It's gonna change a little bit depending on what some of those numbers are, but honestly, that's a pretty damn ugly number. Now, um, if we strip this line out, and I was to say, hey, how do you think with the oil? You'd look at this and go, oh, it's, it's pretty ugly, it's been trending down. It, it's the, the colossal percentage moves. I mean, to be down 26, 27% in a month is pretty phenomenal for anything. You don't usually see that in a year for most major market indexes. So that's where we ended up with for uh, the month on crude oil, by far your worst performer. What's interesting is how quickly it jumps. Now, when we look at the end result for the month of April, very good results. It was one of the best performing months on record for the indexes. That said, you would assume that it would be the inverse of that for gold. Gold still was positive for the month, 5.91%. You can see it's been drifting down over the past few days, but just below that 1700 mark, it's 1693, which normally would be an area of concern for me. But the way that we've seen these positive moves in the market, this huge bullish rally and gold still hold its own, definitely tells me it bodes well for the market moving, uh, for gold still moving to the upside if and when we see some weakness on the overall market. So 5.91% is where we saw gold. And uh, from there, I'll work up our list, go to the S&P 500. Did not make one trade on the S&P today. I was pretty proud of myself. Normally I'll do some trades on the S&P today, did not. Uh, you're looking at a slide, and I'll, I'll update it just to the right where we are right now. Uh, you're looking at about, what that number is hidden from, is that a 12? 12.95%, you have to love a light colored font on a green candle for someone who's colorblind. Uh, so 12.95% up for the S&P, all in all looking great. Um, many people saying it's the best month ever, it's not. If you were to actually take it down from the low that we saw back in uh, March, yeah, it's one of the better 30 day runs, but it, that's not from the, the close of the month. That's gonna be here, uh, where, where is that number? Oh, somewhere in there, I had it just a second ago. Anyway, that was the S&P. Uh, we get a little bit better when we look at the uh, Russell 2000, RTY futures or what I'm gonna show you next. That's about a 14.06% gain. And then NASDAQ, which will be the topic du jour. 
Today, um, we we'll dropped a little bit here, so I guess I could update this. You're looking at about 13.92% for the month. All in all, pretty darn good. And I think that if we step back and look at those numbers, you're thinking, this is a great month, right? Especially in the face of all that's going on behind the scenes. Of course, we know a lot of that is people just buying that dip, trying to park their capital somewhere. It's also the stimulus plans um, and basically people getting their checks. Those sorts of things are pushing this to the upside, but it's still not the best ever. Now, what's interesting now is if we take a, a switch away from the equity indexes and look at something else, let's look at Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency, um, uh, it's actually up again, big time today. For the month, in the last 30 days, you've seen a 37% move to the upside there for Bitcoin. Now, I know many of you are probably gonna look at this on a weekly time frame and go, well, it still has a long way to go until it even gets close to those 20,000 marks that it achieved back in 2017. Yeah, it does. However, it is showing some nice strength to the upside here, and I have to include it as your best one for the month of April. All right, uh, real quick as, I, as I'm trying to go through a bunch of listener questions here. Big Ev says the trillion dollar large caps, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft are all down in the after hours today. This market <laughs> big is going to burst soon. I hope so. I actually shorted yesterday. Um, I had 300 shares of Facebook short, pulled 10 bucks out of it. So 3,000 bucks today was not bad. That really made my day. Um, I'll, I'll show you here. Uh, where's the FB? Ring up FB. I actually, um, I had an order out there for Apple as well, um, but I didn't get executed on that. Basically, after the big spike up, I'll show you the the five minute here so you guys can see what's happening. After that hit that huge spike yesterday on um, Facebook, I decided, you know what, it, it's, it's well overdone. It's coming up into um, areas where I think you're going to see it start to sell off from. So, you see those three lines, those are three separate positions. I basically had 100, 200, and then added the third 100, uh, let it rally off and sold it out. And I'd actually be up even more right now if I was in it, but uh, I didn't wanna look that gift horse in the mouth, was happy to just take that money and run for the day. So that was my my um, Facebook trade. To to the point of here of big, uh, big ebb, that's Facebook. We're looking at the FANG stocks, which we talked about represent so much weight on the NASDAQ on the S&P. So let's go look at uh, Apple. So there's your Apple. I have an order right now sitting to short it at $299.99. You can see my order just sitting out there waiting. Pretty sure I won't get hit. Uh, unfortunately, I was trying to pull up your earnings announcements and I didn't get it. it uh, I didn't put my order in soon enough. Otherwise, I would have probably been filled right now and, and loving an $11 winner. Um, which would have been pretty nice. Uh, right now, you had that big spike up on Apple, but giving, giving it all back, what's noteworthy here is Amazon, all right? And I was joking yesterday, I said, Amazon, I'm bullish, I think Amazon's gonna have a great earnings announcement, and then I stopped and I laughed and I said to myself, now it's probably gonna tank because I said that. Did I not? You guys might remember that from yesterday's show. Lo and behold, take a peek at what happened with Amazon. Here is, oops, let me get your AMZN. There's your Amazon chart, uh, down pretty good in the after hour session, closed today at right around uh, 2460, so you're down about $110 in the after hour session. And that goes back to a question that I'm gonna have to scroll up here in a minute. Um, there was a question that came through earlier from Gaier, and he says, you mentioned, um, you mentioned a book about Candle, actually not, let me get to the Candle book in a minute. There was one asking me about popcorn trade of the day. Where'd that popcorn trade of the day question? Um, this is from Jonathan Coops. Thanks, Jonathan, for the question. Hey, Merlin, can you explain more in detail about your popcorn trades and what they are, or do you even actually trade them? So, yes, I made this graphic because for years I've been calling them the popcorn trade of the day, and, I, and it, it's designed to be more of a joke. Like, do not trade these things. And I, I'm telling you, don't trade them because people who are trying to trade an earnings announcement generally get their asses handed to them on a silver platter. You're either lucky or you're incredibly skilled. My guess is you're just lucky, and I'm not sounding um, condescending because I'm in the same boat. I'm, I'm, if you trade an earnings announcement, it's a crapshoot. It's literally rolling the dice and go, I don't know what I'm gonna get. There might be some probability here, but it's a crapshoot. So I called the popcorn trade of the day because of this. My old thing was, if you knew Apple was coming out with earnings after hours today and Amazon, it's the popcorn trade of the day because I want you to sit back Type in a one minute time frame chart. So I want you to do this exact same thing right here. I'll bring up Amazon, we'll make it a one minute chart, okay? And I so tell everybody, as you're doing this, put your chart to a one minute time frame, lean back in your chair with a bowl of Orville Redenbacher popcorn. It doesn't have to be Orville Redenbacher, I'm just hoping to get a sponsorship soon. And then just sit and watch it. Don't trade it because the moves, I mean, look at this move. It went from, in, in two minutes, 
you went from a high of 2,475 to a low of 2,361. That's a $120 move, roughly, in two minutes. If you're on the wrong side of that, it's your account is gone. So I, I've seen too many people destroyed by earnings announcements, which is why I say, don't trade them. It's fun to watch. It's like a movie. Just sit back, watch it, and be like, damn, somebody made money, somebody lost money. Just It's not worth the risk to you. In everything that we do, whether it's you guys talking to me here on this show or you talking, you know, Traders Army as well with Corey Lane yesterday or Online Trading Academy, the main focus of everything is risk management. As you look at that price chart of Amazon, tell me there's risk involved there. Please tell me you can see that and, and know why you'd want to stay away from it. You know, there was a question that came in from, um, oops, well, I guess I'm jumping the gun here. There was a question that came in. Let me see if I can get to this one. I, didn't I not even put the questions in here? Uh, we'll have to, we'll have to uh, go back to the questions in a minute once I um, upload those. But there was a question asked, how do you trade the earnings announcements? And my simple answer is you probably shouldn't. You guys heard yesterday Corey Lane saying, hey, look, I'm, I stay away from earnings. I just don't even bother. It's not part of my, um, my routine. I just move away from it. And the challenges for us as traders or investors is when you see price moves like this, you, just, you gasp, you go, good God, man, I've got to get in on that. Here's the way you do it. I mean, if you have to absolutely play it, here's how you do it. As it's going into earnings, so let's say you were looking at Apple and Amazon today, you would do something like selling options, selling puts or selling calls, whichever way you thought this market was gonna, whichever way you thought the earnings announcement was going to go, you would sell because the premium is so high and you'd go way outside. So you're still collecting premium, but the, list, uh, the risk of you actually being executed and uh, put or uh, put those shares or having those shares taken away from you is nil, right? You have to go way, way outside. If you were to buy directional, and let's say you thought Amazon was gonna sell off today and you bought some puts before, the premium and implied volatility was so high for that that you may have been absolutely right and it dropped 120 points and you still lost money because it's priced into those the premium of, uh, of those options. So the only way, the only way that I will touch an option or an earnings announcement before it comes out is if I'm selling and even then I'm not really comfortable doing it. I don't like doing that. What I like doing, however, is aftermarket. When you see these things pop, you can set limit orders that are way, way outside of the money, like way, way out there. Like I showed you the Amazon. Oops, it wasn't Amazon, it was Apple. Here's your Apple earnings announcement. It had this initial 60 second spike, right? This is this one big green candle, here's one minute. And then it sold off a little bit and it started to try to rally back up and I could it just felt like the hesitation was gone there. It wasn't moving back up. So I put this order at 299 on this fourth candle from the top. I let the initial surge of euphoria stop. I could probably, if I markets were open and I had the app, uh, potential, I could go and maybe be buying some puts right there, but the market would be closed. So in this case, I just put an order out there because the way these markets have been working, oh, that's right, George. I guess I should cancel my order. It was so inviting. Damn it, George. George called me out on that one. Damn. I'm. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hold on. I'm gonna go out here and go to my order screen. You're right. I, I don't. Even, you know, I got so overwhelmed with it. Um, let's go there. We'll go to my orders, and I will cancel that Apple. Let's get rid of that one right there, just so we, just in case. You guys are keeping me on my toes, and you're absolutely right. I, that was a may have been a major violation. It was just. It was so tempting. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Damn it, <laughs> go to the gulag, <laughs> you guys are great. Oh man, I almost did that, that's pretty bad of me actually. I am, I'm pretty disciplined about that. I don't know, know what overcame me. I just saw it spiking up and I'm, I'm, I'll bet you that tomorrow we'll have a nice down day, but oh well, good, good call. Thank you guys for putting me in my place, damn it. Uh, Apple and Biotech, for those who don't know, are my no-no stocks, that is really, really funny. Um, all right, so the, again, the other way would be uh, you're selling options, taking advantage of that implied volatility before, but I think that's too damn risky. The second one would be once earnings come out and you get these massive spikes, and it's not just um, you know Apple or Amazon. These are the, the major high flyers, but look at Microsoft. I mean, this is a stock that's got a massive float out there. We'll have to go back to its earnings announcement, which is a couple days ago. And I wanna say, uh, zoom, let me just go five minute here. So there's your earnings announcement for Microsoft after hours. I mean, this it, it's not as, as um, amazing as you saw with the Amazon in such a short period of time, but in like a half hour, this thing moved up 5%. For a company that's got billions and billions of shares, 
that that's that's a tough feat to move something like that. So um, my uh, Microsoft big popcorn trade of the day. You also had uh, Google, which came out earlier in the week. There's your Google sell off. I mean Google tanked. So there's a lot of um, a lot of potential, but I just think it's too dangerous. So I would go out there and I would find after these initial big moves have happened, is there an area where I might want to go counter that? Because there's fear out there. If we look what happened with Apple today, here's Apple, right? It reported earnings and it just vaulted up. For me, 300 is a is a pretty significant number, right? It's a it's a whole number psychology, kind of like we talked about with David Warner. I'm a huge believer in whole number psychology and how there's this magnetism to price. So I'll put that line on the screen here. You guys can hopefully see that one. Uh, I might have to make it a little bit thicker because I, I know the screen resolution isn't that best. So I'll make it a little bigger there. And if I go back to a daily, it's it's coming right into this area over here, which isn't the best supplies in the world. I will give you that. It's not the best, but it is an area where we saw a pretty significant downside move. So I'm using the whole number. I'm using the the the, the weak supply zone as a potential for this thing reversing. And you have so many people right now jumping on the bandwagon to buy Apple that to me it just makes for a natural short to go counter trend after the big impulse moves. Okay. Um, where do you see how many shares a symbol has? You go to any regular site like Yahoo Finance would be an easy one. Um, so you can go here just to put in perspective because this is an interesting piece. Let's go to uh, bu bu bu. where's my uh, let's look up MSFT. And what you want to look at is uh, shares outstanding or float. Those are two different numbers, but they're usually very, very close. And if you look under, um, I believe it's profile. Apple or uh, Yahoo started charging for these things, which made it kind of weird. And by the way, those are tuned in just for candlesticks. I, I know I got to get to candlesticks. I'll do it in just a sec. Um, no, it's not under profile. Dab nab it. It's under statistics. So it'll tell you um, where in the heck is it? There we go. Shares outstanding. So shares outstanding is 7.61 billion shares. For Microsoft, in order to move 7.61 billion shares, you've got to be doing a ton. I mean, that is an unbelievable amount of volume. For example, take a, let's take a peek at Tesla and see what the same numbers are for Tesla. Even though it's a $781 stock, it only has 130, 140, sorry, 184 million, not billion, million. So the amount of shares to move Microsoft is so much more than it is with something like Tesla. Uh, you guys probably want to know. Let's look at Google. Let's go check out Google's um, float and shares outstanding. Again, to move this is super challenging. I mean, they have 340 million shares outstanding, which is interesting. I have to figure out why that is, because the float should be less than the shares outstanding. Um, so something's wrong there with that number. But bottom line is you're looking millions versus billions. So way, way lower. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something to take into consideration, Walter. And this is one of those ones that bugs me when people go, Oh well, it's a it's a dollar fifty stock. There might be a billion shares of that dollar fifty stock, but if I go to a hundred dollar stock and say there's a million shares out there, you go, oh, it's overpriced. It's not relative to its shares outstanding. Something we need to take into consideration. Yeah, uh, Berkshire Hathaway has very few shares out there. That's why it's one of the most expensive stocks in the world. Okay, I have been going on way 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 too long on this one. Let me real quick. Uh, I apologize. I thought I had this all ready to go for you guys, and I didn't. I am going to bring up um, a real quick little presentation that has a couple questions. I thought I actually took all the questions out and saved them for you. So let me um, include these. Uh, it'll take me just a second. I should have done this earlier. I've got four, five questions that wanted to be brought into today's discussion. And I will put those right here. And now I will go into it. All right. So. The beauty of live stuff, guys. I'll tell you. All right, there is your. Uh, you'll see an earnings count here in just a second. There's your earnings count. Okay, cool. Now I'll go into your your questions, and this deals a lot with candlesticks. So, the first one that came through was this one from FX Telepath, who's joining us on our YouTube channel today. So, FX, welcome. He says, "Do you use engulfing candles in your trading? I've been back testing a lot lately, and noticed that supply and demand zones with engulfing candles work extremely well." Yes, um, I do, but there's one gigantic asterisk that you have to understand with regards to candlestick formation. So I want to show you a couple formations first, 
Well, I'll show you two engulfings, and then I'll show you my per, uh, my personal favorites. But there is a massive flaw with them that you have to understand. So the first one, and this goes back to FX Telepath's question, was a bullish en or an engulfing pattern. So let me explain what those are for those of you who may not understand Candle Six at this point. It's very very simple. Steve Nissen uh, basically took a Japanese system of measuring rice prices or tracking rice prices, which was known as Japanese candlesticks. Uh, he westernized this and now it is one of the more popular technical analysis tools. So you have to understand that they will label a candle anything. Any one candle or two candle has a name in, candle, in Japanese candlesticks. We just need to find out the ones that are important. So the first thing we want to know is what is a bullish engulfing? Number one, if it's a bullish engulfing, security needs to be trending down. So trending down is like the first and foremost qualifier for a bullish engulfing. As it's trending down, that first candle is down or a doji. So this black candle here, uh, black would indicate a red candle and white would indicate a green candle. I, I'm colorblind, so red and black are, or black and white are easier for me. So you've got this market trending down, you've got this candle heading down, looking ugly, it's a red candle or a black candle depending on how you color your charts. Then that second candle was an up and I put ERC, which stands for expanded range candle. It's kind of common nomenclature in the market. And basically what that does is that candle engulfs the whole thing. It, it eats up this previous candle. So that little black candle, including the tails, you see the topping and bottoming tail here, they all fit within the body of the next candle, if that makes sense, right? This white candle is just a solid body, does not have any topping or bottoming tails. It doesn't need to be that way, but that's just the visual here. But you'll notice that if I were to draw lines, it would eat up this whole piece. Um, actually, I think I can draw on the screen here, which would be really cool. I don't know if I could do it here. Oh yeah, baby. Um, Notice that if I was to do that, that this little candle right here fits completely inside of this one. That's what makes this an engulfing. Now the flip side of this would be to look at something like a bearish engulfing. Similar situation. You're looking for something in an uptrend. This is the most important part about candles is location, location, location. So if you have a, a market that's trending up, you've got a nice little green candle right here. Uh, in this case it's showing up as white, but I'm circling it. That would be a green or a white candle showing up move. Then the next candle is a big expanded range candle that engulfs it, meaning that you could fit that previous candle completely inside with wicks and all inside of the body of that candle. That's what makes it an engulfing formation. Now the problem is that it's very late, okay? It's reactionary. So I'm gonna just quickly show you, these are some old charts I have, but you can see here, there's actually multiple examples of engulfings, um, but I, I kind of wanted them for you know, the, the ideal ones. If you look here, you can see uh, this, this market has been selling off here. Oops, I'll draw it on this screen. You're selling off, and then you have this little engulfing formation right there. Basically, this tiny little white guy, even though it's a white candle right there, you can see this small little guy right here, I know it's hard to see. Even though it's white, it's still an engulfing candle because the next day ate it up. It fits completely within, and it was at the bottom of a downtrend. So that is a bullish engulfing. You may also notice that there's one back here, but that's not an engulfing because that little guy did not engulf the previous day. Why is this, um, is there a filter for those four patterns? Yes, there is, there is. And I'll, I'll see if I can bring it up here and show you um, in just a sec. So the problem with these that I have with all candlesticks, including my favorite patterns, is they're lagging, they're late. So if you see an engulfing pattern, what it's showing you is showing you that yes, there is a positive change in sentiment at that moment in time. So let's say, for example, we go back to this candle here with my horrible graph, my horrible drawing skills, which I don't know how to uh, erase all that stuff, so I apologize. Um, I think I can just erase all, there we go. Um, we go back to that formation on a bullish engulf. Or, haha, who did this? Who built this stuff and typed the wrong thing? That's a bearish engulfing, guys. This is what I get for rushing. I'll do it here. That is a bullish engulfing. Okay, Phew. see see what happens when you try to rush and get stuff done for you guys? Um, I mentioned it's late. By the time you'd be looking to buy this, it would already be out of the zone or moving higher, right? If you, if you bought right there, it's late. You're leaving money on the table. So to go to FX, um, I forgot the name of it, FX Forecast or FX Telecast or something, <laughs> uh, what the gentleman's name was. If you have the demand zone drawn and price is selling off comes down into that zone it comes right into it now you're making that trade 
if you have an engulfing pattern, which now is reactionary to the demand zone, right? It's actually reacting to the buyers that are there and moving up, then you could, FX Telebot, that's it. Then you could potentially buy or add to your position once it moved out of the zone, but, but it's lagging. So therefore, these, if you're trading in engulfing, it leaves a lot of money on the table. Psychologically, it's a very positive sign for that security because for whatever reason, it stopped making this continuous downtrend. The little, uh, it was negative the day before, but then today's activity just started at a low, ended at a high, showing big enthusiasm on the part of the buyers, taking the sellers out of the picture. It is a nice sign of a trend reversal. So the only issue is they're lagging. Uh, FX says, I, would, I wouldn't buy the bullish engulfing after it formed more that I would buy it uh, on a retest of it. Okay, that, that's actually good. So if you, okay, I see what you're saying. So if this helped define your zone, and then later on, uh, it bounced up out of the zone and came back down towards that engulfing formation, then that would be um, a potential buy point for you, if I read that correctly. So was again, oh, we should wait for the retest there. Yes, I think, Mind Jedi, I think that it's tricky to say. I think that you should be buying because price came into your supply zone or demand zone, and that's what was the foundation for your trade. If you're buying because of that, and then the next candle shows a, an engulfing formation that moved out of your demand zone, you could add to it and start to build a bigger position because that engulfing pattern was obviously a very positive sign. If that makes sense. Cool. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, are those two trend reversal formations, Walter? Yes, they are. Those are two trend reversal formations. Now, I, I say that lightly because you know there's this this feeling that if you say something's a reversal, that it always happens. You have to understand that nothing always happens. <laughs> it happens until it doesn't. So while we look at that reversal formation of an engulfing, bullish or bearish engulfing, and we make our trades off of it, we have to be ready at all times for it not working. You know, so we can go into the two different examples that were presented here. We can go into the first example, which is me saying, you're buying at a demand zone, then you see the engulfing, add to it as it leaves. Okay, that's one scenario. If I'm wrong with that scenario, what do I need to do? I need to put a stop loss on this chart. Let me clean it, clean up uh, the graphics here. I need to put a stop loss somewhere down here. So if I'm wrong and that sentiment isn't actually there because it's bullish engulfing and it comes back down and takes me out, fine, so be it, we'll, we'll call it a day. Now, if you look at the, the example that um, FX Telepath is talking about, you're, you could have a situation like this. It's selling off, I'm drawing in red right now, it's different, and then you have an engulfing pattern, right? So let's say you've got your engulfing pattern here, it happened. And he's saying, well, I'll wait for it to go up and then come back down, right? And, and test the zone again. So once it gets back in here, I'm using that as that engulfing as the potential buy point, it's in a demand zone. But again, he's still gonna do the same thing. If it breaks down below there, you gotta have your stop loss in place. So you, you know, even if you're using these, you've got to be ready for being wrong with that specific pattern. There's nothing concrete about them. To me, they're odds enhancers, and I love looking for them. Now, let me go and show you two of my personal favorites. Let me see if I can bring this up here. Uh, I gotta go through this. Uh, and these are my favorite. Oh, sorry, I didn't even have it on screen. Good, I was filtering through stuff pretty quick. Um, this is just a, what's called a bullish hammer formation. So you have a bullish hammer, the other one's called a shooting star or a bearish hammer. Um, good. Yes, always have stops, uh, Walter. That's, that's the key to staying alive in this game and living in a long life as a trader is making sure that you don't take that one colossal hit. And, I, and you know, last two Mondays ago was an example of that. That crude oil for me. I was long crude oil when you had that monstrous down day when we went negative $40 per contract on the CLK. I was long the CLM. Of course, I took a stop loss. You know, and I was pissed off when it happened. I was upset. I was like, damn it. Didn't want to take a loss. It was it was a pretty big one too, but I tell you what, when I woke up in the morning and saw the crude oil, the CLM had dropped all the way to 650. I'm like, yeah, baby, stop losses. That might have blown that account. So you have to always use stop losses, even if you don't want to. You have to. Okay, so let me go into my two favorites here. And again, these are lagging because I need to wait for market to to prove something. Now the way this works is the same as an engulfing, but what I like better is the way that this works. So for example. Let me see if I can uh, draw. Yeah, I won't let me use any um, drawing tools here. But it, at some point, this candle all the way down to here was a giant red or black candle, right? The whole bottom of that thing. It was ugly. And then for whatever reason, buyers came in and they had the last word. And they pushed it all the way up and it closed at the high. 
I used to always make a joke when I taught classes and I said, if you have a relationship and you're significant with your significant other and you guys are fighting, you know, what's the most important word in that argument? It's so funny. All the men in the class always goes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe that's the most important word in, in, a, in a marital relationship. But in a battle, it's whoever has the last word, right? In this case, when you look at a hammer formation, the buyers had the last word. So if there's a tug of war, if there's a battle between buyers and sellers, then the buyers won in a hammer formation. Again, it's about location. Now the point I'm saying that's lagging here is all this move, all this long bottoming tail here, which I have completely destroyed with my horrible art skills, that long bottoming tail, that's all potential money. So if I was trading and I found a demand zone where, oops, where I had drawn, let's say I drew my demand zone, uh, let me get the pen here. I had a demand zone for whatever reason, somewhere down in here. Great, I'm buying because that tail dipped in. I'm not buying because there's a hammer formation. Now the next day, I might be buying. And I have my specific rules on how I buy hammer formations, but again, they're lagging. So the opposite of this, the flip side, same thing. It's just considered a shooting star. These are actually my personal favorite because markets move faster to the downside. There's more fear out there generally than there is greed. Uh, that might not be present in today's markets because it seems like greed is the way to go. Uh, but when things start to move south side, people freak out really, really quick and that's when we get monster moves to the downside. So it's same thing, gotta beat an uptrend. Markets moving to the upside. At one point, this was a gigantic green candle or in this case, white candle. But for whatever reason, the sellers had the last word and pushed it all the way back down till it closed right here. Uh, since it's white, it would close right there. So the battle was won by the sellers at the last minute. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. And then, and then flowers show up the next day, right? So here's a couple examples of those so you guys can see. You know, they're, The reason I've highlighted these, and you might notice there's some other ones, right? And it's kind of difficult for me because I'm looking at multiple charts here. Let me see if I can bring this up and uh, make this full screen. Um, Look uh, on the screen, I'm gonna just, in my poor drawing, you see right now there's four circles. Those are decent examples of shooting stars. The hammer formations are the best because notice where they're at. They're after big moves down, huge moves down, right? These become really powerful. Now if you get those in conjunction with high volume, great. Interestingly enough, we could break this chart down here and probably have found a demand zone somewhere down in here that would have been perfect for the second hammer that showed up in October. But you'll notice there's a bunch. There's this guy right here. But it's not really in an uptrend. I mean, it's kind of sideways for six or seven bars. So that's not that important to me. Uh, is there another couple? I mean, you'll see a bunch of them in here, this area here. So it really has to be at an extreme. That's what makes them better for me. They're more powerful when they're at those types of extremes. So um, I will leave it there for a second. Are there any questions on, on the candle piece of it? I know I went through those rather quickly. Um, there's a lot of information in there, but I wanted to real quickly just say, this is kind of how I look at them and how I use them with regards to um, my trades. Any questions on those? So where would you enter in a hammer shooting star the next? Okay, perfect, Walter. Um, that's kind of you know going into my style. Uh, let me see, if I'll, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to run a filter here on TradeStation. So let me go back and I'll show you real quick in TradeStation how you run a filter. Yeah, um, and FX, Telepath, and others, l let me please just emphasize it. Those are just ones that I like. You know, some people really like the Harami formations. Uh, there's abandoned babies, there's falling windows. There's so many weird little patterns out there, names. What I like about the Hammer and Shooting Star is it's very easy for me to set rules for it. I have a very simple rule with regards to those patterns and I'll show you. So let me let me bring up TradeStation, see if I can run a quick filter or scan for you. We'll do it on the S&P. So you guys can see right now, hopefully it's somewhat visible. This is that scan that we ran on the S&P 500 uh, and did our filters. So we took out, I think we took out filters. I don't think we did, that can't be right. This is maybe one that I didn't quite finish. So let me, let me finish this filter up here because I'm certainly not gonna trade something that has an average daily volume of 200,000 shares. So we did not finish this filter, but I'll do it right now. So basically this filter should have uh, removed any stocks that have less than 1.5 million shares traded per day. I'm gonna remove anything under $15. Okay, so we're good. So now we're down to, should be about 370, 362. So our S&P 500 down to 362. I will go in here and I'm gonna just add in an analysis technique. Now there are other sites where you can go do this at. It's usually a subscription base you have to pay for. Um, 
I am not a fan of paying for things. <laughs> so let me go up here and go to candles. You go to candle C for candlesticks, should be right there. And it's hard to read. I will put in, uh, there's hammer. I'll add that one. And then there's also shooting star and I'll add that one. All right, so now what it's gonna do, it's gonna just give me a mark, put a mark right on the ones that have the specific formation that I'm looking at. And I'll get rid of hanging man and I'll zoom to the top and I'll show you if there are any, right? And it's gonna do this on a daily basis. So right now it says there's only two hammer formations and no shooting stars, isn't that nice? So I will move this over here. We can see that uh, E, V, R, G and Akamai, both are having hammer formations. So let's go back to a daily chart and I'll bring up EVRG. Now, what it did is it runs a filter and you can see here, I mean, I, I really wouldn't call that a hammer formation. Yeah, it, it jumped down, but it's it's not that appealing, right? It, it Technically, visually, sure, it's a hammer, but it doesn't. it's not in a location that I find interesting. It's not really at a demand zone. It's not really in a strong downtrend. So I would just pass this one up. It's no big deal. Akamai. Okay, this is interesting. Um, this may actually make a play for me maybe tomorrow. Here's why. If you look at that chart, what's noteworthy is, let, let's forget about today's candle. Look at the one that happened yesterday. If I were to see, ah, come on Merlin. If I was to see that candle right there, I would be salivating. Look at the, the length of that tail tells you that this thing was getting absolutely slaughtered yesterday and then came all the way back up on close right near the high. That's a pretty strong sign of buying momentum and that generally will continue. There's a higher probability of it continuing to the upside the next day. So what would I do? Simple. I put a line right across the high of that candle right there, which the high of that uh, hammer formation was 98.48. I will make this bigger so the viewers at home can see it because I know it's kind of tough to see. 14, make that bold. I'll make that my default. And there you guys, it's 98.48 on the left hand side there. So really what I'm looking for is I need it to open up anywhere below 98.48, anywhere below it, and then if it crosses above it, then I'm looking at a potential buy. It's almost like a breakout trade that Corey was talking about yesterday. It's just putting a simple rule to something, right? I think, I think this is probably the most important piece that you guys should be getting from not just myself, but from the guests I bring on the show is a lot of them are gonna be using tools and strategies and techniques that, that you probably may have never heard of, don't care to use or just just aren't really your thing. The important part there, especially what Corey was talking about, Jeff Manson on Tuesday was great about this as well, is he's using a strategy, but he has very specific rules tied to that. So while his strategy may not work for you, and I, I kind of figured that comment out from a few viewers, uh, that strategy didn't work for them. Well, it's okay, let's find something that does work for you and find rules to put around that. Corey Lane was uh, really saying, look, I need to make sure that it has basing going on for those breakout trades and then room to run. Those are his two qualifiers. Now I'm sure if you spent time with him and study with him, he would go into the mechanics of exactly where he's putting those entries, stop loss and targets, but it's all specific rules. So when I look at this hammer formation, for me, it has to open below, it has to. If it doesn't open below, let's say it opened up at 100. I'm not interested because the momentum, the reason I thought that it was going to move up already happened, done, forget it. So you go forward to the next day, what happened? I wouldn't have made a trade. There'd be a no trade on that one. Now, could I do the same thing again today with today's trading on um, Akamai? Sure, it closed today at 97.71. I think I gotta put this on snap. Let me go to snap mode. But the high of this was 97.95. So I could, do the same thing and say, you know what, if it opens up tomorrow, somewhere down below 97.95 and then moves above it, then I'll buy. Because it's showing me that that, format, that energy, that momentum, that inertia is still there, I'm gonna push it to the upside. Does that make sense, everybody? I'm hoping that, uh, hoping it did. I see someone mentioning scotch in the chat. What's going on, what's going on there, Randall? What do I gotta do for, what do I gotta do for scotch? I'm more of a bourbon and rye guy, but. Anyway, that makes sense, everybody? Did I help? I'm hoping so. Okay, I'm gonna go to a couple list of questions here uh, and then I'll wrap it up. We're already, what time are we? Oh yeah, we're already way long. Um, would that be a double hammer? Sure, yeah, why not? Why not? It's a double hammer. Um, I, I did find it rather interesting that there was no sh no shooting stars. Um, no, Not one shooting star today. That's a pretty bullish sign out there in the market. 
Cool. Uh, let's see. Let me try to go to a couple of questions here rather quickly because I know I'm, I'm almost out of time. Um, so that was one from FX Telepath on Facebook. So FX, thank you for that one. I appreciate it. Hopefully I answered your question. Um, I already answered this one from Sarah about earnings report. You said... <laughs> oh, I buy things. I buy scotch. I, have, I guess I have a fairly nice collection of, of, of stuff. Um, Natalia, this is good. Now, for those of you who saw the <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, chart of the week that I did, I'm now going to release those every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock where I'll go in and do a little bit of commentary on something I see that's rather interesting in the markets. And I did one last week on retail sales. I thought that was a really important one to show how those numbers have just really started to drop. And to me, we are a spending society. And Natalia sends in a good, good comment. She says, would you say this is more of a strategic investor perspective than for daily income trader? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when you look at some of the macro numbers, you have to think long term. And obviously, uh, if I'm a short term day trader like today, you know, I made a pretty much a day trade on Facebook. I'm not worried about retail sales. I could care less. I was just trying to trade or fade the enthusiasm after the earnings announcement came out. Normally, something like retail sales numbers, the only time I'm that interested in it from a short-term basis is, is that announcement happening while I'm in the market? That's the only area where it gets very dangerous. Yes, Arvin, I know. I could go longer and longer and longer. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Dave. Yeah, it, Actually, shout out to my dad. He bought me this one for my birthday a while back. I don't really wear it too much, um, but yeah, I like it. It's start, starting to grow on me. It's a nice Southern California tropical shirt. So yeah, and to tell you, a lot of that stuff will be macro. You're looking at the much broader picture. Uh, and I think I had one more, and that was going back to, we have it there? Here's the final one from Scott. He says, is it logical to purchase extremely cheap out of the money put options on SPY leading up to the uncertainty of the March drop? Sure. Absolutely. If you felt it's going to drop, you know, I still think it's going to drop, although it's becoming, um, rather crazy how bullish and strong these markets have become. I, I think that we still have a wave in front of us, but there's others who feel we've bottomed. Sam was talking in his XLT sessions on how uh, the bottom is in, and he could absolutely be right. You know, the thing there is I have my opinions, uh, others, you all have your opinions. Only problem is I can't let myself get too hung up on my opinions, right? I don't want to get caught holding that opinion as it wipes out my account. So this market could break through to all-time highs. To me, that seems inconceivable at this point, but um, when you look at the amount of retail investors who are now bearish on the S&P 500, it's like 80% are bearish, which tells me the market's going up. <laughs> I hate to say it. It's, I mean, when you look at the retail investor, they're generally wrong. And if that many people are saying that their market's going down and they're going short, then this market's probably going to continue to move to the upside until that imbalance changes. I'll let you know when those numbers shift. But right now, it, it's uh, way, way too lopsided and just going to wipe out the retail investors. Yes, uh, Mike, I do think it's there is the potential for a, a 1987 kind of, of, of market crash, you know, the black swan event. And, and again, back to Scott A's question here about buying cheap out of the money options. If you go back to the February 18th or 19th show under Power Trading Radio, we interviewed Steve Moses and that was the topic of discussion. It says, if you want to protect yourself against a black swan event, buy deep, deep out of the money. We were talking about 250 SPY uh, put options. They were cheap as heck, man. You could, a couple bucks. Maybe less than that. And of course, that's when we're at 330 on SPY. Well, you know, a 250 put option was nothing. It was dirt cheap. Well, within a month, we hit 250. Those options would be through the roof, but that's really protecting yourself if you felt there's a major downside movement coming. And I do think uh, that there's going to be more downside moves. So yes, Scott, you absolutely could be buying deep out of the money put options. Market timing is going to be key there. As we continue to rally, there will be... Um, less fear in that marketplace and those options may start to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper um, cool all right I, I think I covered just about everything I wanted to get to today um, I, I wanted to get to more questions but I, I didn't have time um, when the reality of the opening of the economy doesn't pan out it will drop again yes I, I, I believe that and I think that the numbers have not yet been reflected. We got, as I mentioned, you know, Q1 earnings really only reflected one month of quarantine. Q2 earnings will represent more than that and then the reopening where everything's sluggish, you'll see businesses that just aren't going to reopen. Um, you'll also see some people who are going to sit at home on unemployment and rather take unemployment for $1,000 a week than go out there and, and try to find a job making $1,000 a week. It's like, hold on a sec, I would, should I go out and pursue a job 
when I might be flipping burgers, making a grand a week, or could I just stay at home and hang out with my dog and go hiking every day, making a grand a week? I know I don't want to sound uh, usurious of the system, but I tell you, if you're going to give me two options, one of those is go work and make a thousand dollars, or one sit at home and do whatever you want, and make a thousand dollars. I think there's a lot of people that aren't going to want to go out there, so it's going to be rather interesting. Um, Joseph says California beaches are closed. Yeah, Dog Beach has been open, been open every day, so um, I'll, I'll check it out this weekend. Although it's been rather crazy uh, at the beaches, to be sure. Um, Dave says, "Holy crap, your sessions are valuable." Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, you know, sometimes I, I feel like they're not, but I'm glad that you guys enjoy it and get a lot out of it. Uh, if you do, give, obviously give me a give me a thumbs up. That helps out a lot. Uh, is the Amazon formation after hours a pennant on the one minute time frame? Why not check it out? You asked. I'll go bring up the Amazon on a one-minute time frame. Now, I normally don't look at one minutes, guys. I used to when I was a day trader, um, a high-speed day trader. I, I don't really look at one minutes anymore. It's too, you get chopped out too much. AMZN is the symbol we're looking at. TJ, you messed up. Uh, one-minute time frame is that a pennant formation? Nah, nah. And I think what you're looking at is this. You're gonna take that snap off. You're probably looking at this right here would be my guess um, you know that's it's a little tricky if you do it here but I would if I was doing a pendant formation or trying to draw the trend lines it'd be something like that right and that's mainly this body here but we've already crossed over that it's too late I, I wouldn't call that a pendant formation and remember the the further we get into the, the after hour session the more dangerous this one becomes okay it, it becomes way more dangerous because liquidity will dry up on this bad boy so be careful out there if you're doing it um, oh great I, I try, Kevin, I'll let you follow the news for me. I really try not to follow the news because I feel like it just, it makes me so upset sometimes. Um, but yeah, President Trump is, is always fun for acting, uh, acting some nice moves in our market. All right, cool. Um, if you guys have any last minute questions, send them on in or put them down below the video. I will do my best to get those ones answered for you. Hopefully we got enough of them answered today. Uh, yeah, I got a, we, we, the show is getting progressively longer and longer and longer. It's 80 degrees out. I'm going to go for a walk with my dog in the back bay. They haven't closed that part as well. Yes, Austin, the amount of memes right now, it, it's, it's saving the world right now. It's how funny some of these memes are. It's awesome. Uh, again, if you guys have questions, a couple ways you can do it. Number one is to go down below the chat on YouTube. Type your questions down there. Most of the questions I read today were from that and from Facebook, so um, those are the questions I will answer first. You can always send me in comments, suggestions. If you have something personal, you don't want to be on a Facebook page or a YouTube page or anything like that, you can go to TraderMerlin.com. There's a little message button. That will come directly to me. Uh, if it's something that you don't want me to post or don't want me to, to address or say your name, then please say that as well. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. You know, Somebody might send in a... I don't know, a document with their 401k and they go, I don't want you to mention my name. Then just tell me that because sometimes I usually mention the first name, not the last, but um, I'm always happy to help out any way I can. So you can send in questions there, but down below the YouTube videos is the best way that interacts with chat. Obviously, give me a, a thumbs up if you like uh, like what we were discussing today. Tomorrow should be a fun one. It's, of course, our Friday show. Uh, and yes, I have had a complaint or two that they don't like me drinking and it promotes alcohol. I know, I apologize, but there's just some things... I'm not going to change. You know, I have a little bit of a potty mouth. I apologize for that for those of you who can't stand that either. Um, but I like to have a cocktail on a Friday. It's a, it's a long week. Earned a nice little refreshing beverage. I'm not getting hammered, but I'm going to have one cocktail with you guys on the show tomorrow. So I will see you guys tomorrow. Sam Evans will be our guest, will be our guest talking Forex. Again, questions, send them on in. Smash the like button. Hit the bell. And if you're not a new subscriber, hit the subscribe button. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Take care. See you tomorrow.